Hey, folks. We'll call the uh, morning session of February 11th quarter, sir. Would you please call the roll? Oh, okay. sorry. Aldrich? Here. Uh, Christensen? Here. McKeon? Here. Peterson? Here. Tomzik? Here. Tucker? Here. And Barman? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, we will proceed with the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Join me. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands. stands. One, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. So before we proceed with the agenda, we're going to do good news, but I want to take just a minute. Um, we all, I think we all, or many of us that knew this individual, got some sad news that Steve Schneider, <coughs> board member, I know Kathy knows him very well, uh, passed away last week. And I wanted to take just a minute to recognize Steve. I think he certainly deserves that. If I'm not mistaken, Steve served on the board for 15 years, uh, according to what Sarah had provided, uh, which is one of the longer tenures. Actually, Kathy Bush in the audience has, was on there for 20 or more, and Mary Ramansky was on there for 20 uh, as well. But Steve served for a number of years, put in a lot of service. I think he held every single yeah. office uh, during his tenure on the board. I had the good fortune to serve with Steve um, parts of both of my first two terms and just want to recognize him and his contributions as a strong proponent for education in Shakopee, uh, his service to the community, it's in his whole family. His wife was a fax teacher, his daughter is a fax teacher. Um, so I think it's appropriate that we recognize Steve and, and um, think of the family at this time as well, but certainly to recognize his service. So I just appreciate that, and Steve and the family, we sure we thank you very much. Thanks, Rich. Okay, we will proceed with uh, item number three, which is good news. Um, I'm going to actually let you take 3.1 school board recognition. It seems a little something <laughs> I shouldn't do. Well, next week, I'm sure we all know this already, but I'll share it anyhow. Next week is uh, school board recognition week, so February 18th to the 22nd. So just wanted to take a moment and say thank you to the members of our school board let you know that I appreciate and many others appreciate the great work that you do and then we do have a certificate of appreciation for your service and so just want to say thank you and uh, we will be celebrating you it's February 11th we don't meet next week but uh, we will be celebrating you all next week and thanking of you and appreciating your service so thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you. and like we have um, we have some principals here too that is correct. We have an even more special appreciation than what I just did. Um, our principals, as soon as I get the certificates passed out, uh, they've been kind enough. They took the initiative, uh, and I'll let them explain what, what, they've, uh, what they've got up their sleeves. Derek, Christy, all right. Gifts, yes. My name is Derek Felton, principal at Sweeney Elementary School. Christy Board, principal of Central Family Center and Equity Programming Principal for the district. And we are here on behalf of the elementary principals and myself to share a book with you um, that meant something to our elementary schools. And I'll let Derek explain that a little bit. Yeah, so every year we, we celebrate Friendship Week. Uh, it's usually in October. We look at kind of the anti-bullying month. And this year, the book we chose was uh, Exclamation Point. Okay, and it's a book about uh, standing out yet fitting in. And it was, a, it was our theme throughout all of our elementary. So, in a, in a way for us to say thank you from uh, the elementary principals especially, but all of our staff here at Shakopee, we want to thank you for your service because it's a lot of work and uh, sometimes there's a lot of turmoil, And but we appreciate you guys doing whatever you need to do to make sure our, our jobs and, and our, our kids are in good hands. So we appreciate it. Uh, we actually address these books to each of you, so we're gonna hand these out now. Uh, just as a token of our appreciation. Sign. So, no, right? We, we did not sign, sign, up, sign. But We have your name. Okay, so, Mr. Okay. Rowan is you. yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, they sell well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All sorts of stuff. Wonderful. Well, here you go. Oh, wow. Here's me. And. So if you go around to uh, the elementary, if you're, you're able to make it out into the buildings, you, you'll, a lot of the buildings, you'll see the exclamation points up on the walls. What we did was all the kids had an exclamation point that they had to decorate with acts of kindness, kind words, 
things that uh, that they took away from our conversations during that week. So hopefully I'll be able to get a chance to see those. So thank you for your service. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please thank all the principals yes. when you just did. All right, we move to item 3.2, uh, something near and dear to my heart, Chocolate <coughs> Educational Endowment <coughs> Foundation Seif. I think we've got three representatives tonight, Kathy, Steph, and Alex. Thank you for allowing us to take a few minutes of your board meeting tonight um, to talk about something that is dear to our hearts, and I know a couple of the board members here have been members, Reggie was um, a member for a number of years of the seat board and Christy currently is, so we're very, very appreciative of your past efforts too. Um, I'm Kathy Bush and Stephanie Bode, Bode <laughs> and Alex Lemon. We have, um, we are three of the 12 members currently of the seat board. CEF stands for Shakopee Educational Endowment Foundation, um, an organization that certainly works closely with um, the staff of the Shakopee School District. However, we are a separate entity. We're a private 501c3 organization. And some people back in about 1990 had a vision to try to um, support and um, provide some extra funds to the Shakopee School District. And so since 1992, there have been um, grants funded for additional projects that uh, teachers have, have created and um, written proposals for. Since um, 1992, there have been 455 proposals funded for a total of over $369,000. So we are very appreciative to the members of the community and the staff of the school district who have provided the funds to allow that to happen um, these past years. Um, for 2018-19, um, we, we changed up our funding process a little bit. We used to collect grants um, in the fall we decided maybe it would be better um, to try that in the spring to at least put the idea out there so that um, teachers would have some time to think about that when they were trying to get the school year started. Um, this year we received 48 proposals, which was twice the number that we received the pre from the previous year. We like that. The more proposals, the better. And I think as our student population has grown so drastically, um, that we should be, you know, getting more proposals, and we also should be funding more proposals. So that's one of our goals, is to try to fund more. But this year, of the 48 submitted, we did fund 33 proposals. Um, the process for that is the teacher um, writes a written proposal. Uh, the board members, the 12 board members, review those carefully. They're all ranked. And then um, we have a two-step process. We go through them after carefully reading them one time. People provide comments, sometimes that causes us to think a little bit differently about a proposal, and then we go back for a second round of looking at those proposals. We don't have a particular number that we, you know, that we are going to fund or an exact dollar amount. We want to, wouldn't you say, we want to fund those proposals that are truly <coughs> innovative, that will provide something different for the students of Shakopee schools, that actually, you know, just are an extra to all the fine work that you're doing with the things that you're funding already. So um, one thing that's new this year is that um, the board members of SEAF are going to be doing site visits, and that's in process right now, which um, one of our newer board members um, who was retired decided to do that last year, and he was so excited. And you know, as a former board member, I think anytime you can get community members into the schools to that just helps to spread the word about the good things that are happening in the school district. So, so we're all in the process of doing that. Um, and we're hoping too that another thing that will accomplish is to um, maybe have other people in the schools come forward with proposals. So, um, we do encourage planned gifts and annual pledges and there are people who are doing that. And we really are working to try to grow that fund so that we can continue to to bring um, more projects to the classrooms. Um, we also want to be sure that we fund all grade levels. So we have funded um, from early childhood at Central Family Center through the high school and the alternative high school. So all grade levels are being funded. Some of the proposals are district wide and some are school specific. Um, this year we were able to um, boost our efforts a little bit due to the um, generosity of Gary Anger's family. 
with um, designating financial gifts in memory of him to the SEAF Foundation. So. so I think that all of you have received the, the red booklet. And we can thank Christy for that. She actually put that together. We have never, as an organization, done something like that. And so we're very appreciative of that. And we have some extra. Would like that? Would, um, would anybody have questions about anything with this year's grant proposals or funding round? I know some of you are very familiar with this. For some of you, this might be new information. Well, I don't have a question, but as someone who, when I worked for the school district, received these grants, I know how really valuable they are. And as I read through here, and just the creativity I've seen here, integrated, you know, bringing math together with something seemingly unrelated, but not unrelated, and they work it out, and the diversity, bravo, nice work. And that's, I think, what the board members are looking for from CIF is about creativity. How balanced do you try to, uh, for the, uh, how balanced between the, the schools and the grades do you try to be? Because obviously if somebody doesn't propose anything, it'd be hard to, but just out of curiosity. You know, we've worked really hard in the last couple of years to make sure that all levels are aware of the process and to try and encourage all buildings to submit proposals. I don't think we consciously go in saying, um, you know, we're going to dedicate this much to elementary level, this much to high school. Really, it's based on innovation and the merits of the program. Um, some of the things we look for are how many students the project reach, reaches. So a lot of the grants cover more than one elementary school, and that we love to see that because it's shared resources that way. Um, you know, we're looking for the most bang for our buck. So it's not, we don't really have any laser focus on any one area or any one school. It's really just on the merits of the proposals and a strong grant proposal too from the teachers and how are we going to, what outcomes are we going to see. It's more outcome oriented than it is um, focused on balancing. Good. But in, historically it has been, you know, re, reached every level most years. And sometimes, you know, I'll just say that sometimes we don't get a lot of response from, from a particular school for that year. Don't know why, but doesn't mean that if we only have one or two for a particular school that, oh, well, those are the only ones, so they will get the grant. That's not necessarily the case. You know, again, we look at the mission of, of what the organization's about and, and what our purpose is, and the grant matches that. You know, the dollar amount like this year, you know, 30000 something, um, can seem like a very small amount compared to the school district's annual budget. But we think it represents a lot of innovation and a lot of opportunities for those students. So uh, we think there's a lot of bang for the buck with this due to the creativity of the classroom staff. I'd like to applaud your efforts. Um, it's just the impact you guys have is tremendous at the classroom level at the student level which is what i like it's it's I and mean, it's about as grassroots as you can get because the teachers are the ones that are coming up with the idea and submitting it and as i was flipping through this book which by the way is phenomenal i've never seen this done before this is really really good and i love the fact that you know our first year officially in the academies and and i applaud jody uh, for submitting one and this is a perfect example of the academies and, and the, the lens that we're trying to look through it's a history u.s history project or program for the Engineering and Manufacturing Academy. Kind of like, wait a second, the whole idea is to look at history through that lens, which is great. So I just thought that would be one to single out. So great job. Do you have any comments? Yes, go ahead. I was just going to say, if there weren't any other um, comments, then we'd like to kind of officially present you with a check for $30,118. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Alright, where are we going? Uh, Ash, you want to take a picture? Yeah. Where would you like it? <coughs> She's uh, staying right here. Are you going to around for that? Yeah. You need a big camera. You can't really swap that at the mobile deposit. No, you have to go into the bank. Four people might be talking to it. Oh, there's four people. She's been trying to get out of that mobile deposit for that. Hold the picture. Hold the picture.
to accept the agenda as presented and is there any changes or anything that we're aware of, Sarah, tonight? Mm -hmm. Okay, so pretty much as presented, can I have that motion? So Second. Judy, Matt, any discussion on the agenda before we get into it? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. Uh, if we're going to follow the flow, we're just going to start right out with an Academies of Shakopee Ford NGL mid-year report. We got Nancy and Jeff. You guys want to come on down? Sure. Good evening, buddy. Come on, buddy. So, Sarah, yep. Yep. So, um, as part of the January designation ceremony, the other benefit we had at that time was that Star Herman, our Ford uh, Next Generation Learning Coach, was also here at that time as well. And she did a two year, or two day, not two year. <laughs> Two days when it felt like two years, but a, a two a two day um, mid year visit, and um, so if you look at the next slide, uh, just especially for our newer board members, one of the benefits of being in the network is that we've had a coach. Her name is Star Herman. Most of you have probably met Star or have heard her name. Um, she has really been our primary facilitator through all five phases of the implementation process. And so when you look at those five phases, uh, she started with us almost three years ago um, with that exploring <coughs> vision and planning process. And now it's kind of exciting to know that we're into the implementation process. And the implementation uh, phase is two years. It's the first two years of, of doing uh, full implement implementation of the academy model. And she will come two times a year. So she'll do a mid-year check-in, which she just completed at the time of the designation ceremony. And then she'll be back this summer as part of the steering committee's retreat that they do to do another uh, check. And that'll continue into the next academic year as well. And so um, she spent a lot of time with a lot of stakeholders over the course of those two days. Uh, she spent um, uh, with time with the steering committee, one of the industry councils. She met with Mike, she met with Dave, she met with a lot of district office folks, Jenny uh, as well. And then on the second day, she spent the whole day at the high school, met with students, met with academy teams, team yep, leads, leads. Academy the, coach, principals. Mm -hmm. So she really got a good two full days to sort of see where we're at. And so some of the things that she said in her report, we're gonna kind of discuss yeah. tonight, and Jeff's gonna start with what she said are some of our successes so far. Yeah, so she had the report broken down, you know, areas of success, and then, um, which I'll cover on this slide, and then just areas, you know, the next level, where, where do we wanna take it from here? So hitting some of the highlights and the successes, the, the master plan. You know, I think back to two and a half years ago when I came, one of my very first days on the job was, here's the master plan. 60 people in the, in the boardroom here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't was that long ago, but, but really, you know, through the master plan speaks to, with all the change that we've had, right, just in that two and a half years that we've had a plan that's in place that obviously it's a living, breathing document, but it's really been a good, uh, solid foundation for all the work that we're doing around the academies. Um, our, our industry councils, I think just, I think STAR has always been impressed in Shakopee with just the level of community support that we get just coming from every corner of the community. And so our, our industry councils are very strong. Obviously our academy champions play right into that, you know, highlighting um, all of them, but uh, some of the unique items that we have, having a, a city and, and county partnership um, as one of those, the Midewakanton Sioux. I mean, I could I mention all of them, but just the, the strong support that we've gotten from our academy champions. 
our programs of studies, I know most of you have been able to see just the, if you look at each academy, right, the different pathways and just the work that's been done in teaching and learning combined with our, our partners is really as the building, the structure of the building is being created, we have this curriculum that is having teacher input and community input as we're building that um, is definitely a highlight. Um, our, our professional development, we were in a unique situation as far as the time thinking of me coming out more in July of 2016 and now we're just a full semester in. We've really had a lot of time to very be thoughtful and, and planning the, the, uh, the time and effort going into the academy model. Uh, she highlighted our, our freshman academy. You know, this is our group of students that are going to have the full experience all four years. And so she was really impressed when she talks about purity, right? Having uh, all of those ninth graders being, picturing them all on the east side of the building, you know, um, in our two different, uh, our, two, our alpha and our omega team, having those communities, those common teachers, um, she feels we're just coming out of the gates really strong with our freshman academy. And in our identity within our teams, um, I, you know, identity is those teachers coming together in those team meetings and what is it to be a part of arts and communications or, or business and entrepreneurship and, and, and really, you know, our outcome is we want kids to feel like that engagement, we're connected to something and, and although, again, we're only a semester into it, um, Star and Jacob Glenn's at the Academy coach who we've had visited has been really impressed with, um, with the identity that we've, uh, we've created. And then uh, probably for me personally, one of my biggest areas that I'm the most proud of is our, our academy teams. How we've taken a group of teachers who for many of them have, you think of education in the traditional sense. And now we've kind of, we've taken it and you know, we're not departmentalized anymore, we're working in interdisciplinary teams. And to be able to visit all these meetings and watching the ownership and the excitement and a collective group, you know, I've got, combined 180 certified staff of full and part-time teachers just to buy in and coming into those into those team uh, setting and really wanting it to be a good experience for kids has definitely been a highlight for me and then our academy coach Elizabeth Deer is our academy coach I was just in a meeting with her we were over at and trust at a card uh, today she is really being that glue as far as taking those authentic learning opportunities that our partners are just, you know, knocking on the door wanting to bring in and she's really been that glue working with our teachers and our leadership teams to, you know, as we know it's going to be a process, but to make that come to life. So those were some of the uh, successes, if you will, that we wanted to share with, with you. So she had some uh, recommendations and we kind of rolled them up into kind of five uh, bigger areas, but this would be the things that um, as we continue to monitor our plan, adjust our plan that we want to keep moving forward. Um, one is the overall structure of the steering committee, which we talked about with the steering committee when STAR was here. And so uh, now that we're into implementation, the primary role of our steering committee is to monitor implementation of the master plan. And so there are some discussions we're going to be having with that group about how to do that. Um, one of our first jobs this summer is the steering committee. It's their role to set up our summer retreat, which would be to look at data points about where we're headed, what's working, and then actually to make modifications to the master plan or set up the process to make modifications. And so um, th there was quite a few suggestions about how to do that process. And then the second thing is our industry councils are transitioning and we actually started working on this with Jeff's team um, at the last meeting with the industry councils. By and large, our industry councils have been amazing and they've helped us, especially for, um, if you remember, the, I call them the grids or their instructional frameworks for each academy where you see the programs of study. have had a huge influence on what courses we're offering, what sequence in terms of pathways or programs of study we're offering, but we're coming close to being done with that process in terms of the course development. And really they need to pivot now to helping to sustain partnerships within each academy. And so um, 
Jeff's team, their academy principals, Elizabeth, are going to be transitioning to take over that role. In the past, it's been led by teaching and learning, those six industry councils. So that will be fully transitioned to them uh, next year, and Star had some good ideas about things that they should be working on. And then the next one, transition to the block. We're spending a lot of professional development time right now in January. This Friday we have a, a PD day, and it's right when you're going from a 45-minute seven-period day and moving into a four-period, 85-minute uh, block. You've got to look at how you teach, right, and uh, and and how you implement that. And we are, uh, you know, in January we were doing work, you know, starting right from the ground, take your, take your units and let's start breaking those up, but then it's taking it a step further, right? We know that in an 85 minute block, it, we, we can't do a sit and get, right? So how do we, how do we engage students in that instruction? And um, so we, we're doing a lot of work with that in March and April on our early release days. We're going to have additional work around that. We'll actually be doing um, some practice with our students and uh, getting them on the block and right, those, the calendar works out good with those early release dates because you can get that in a, you know, kind of a Wednesday, Thursday uh, kind of a deal. So um, doing a lot, of, a lot of work and talking about different types of instructional strategies, which, which I would argue a lot of our teachers do it right now, but now it's just looking at, okay, we're kind of taking our time going like this, and how do we make that time more, more meaningful? So obviously that's a big ticket item. And it really related to that is the authentic learning piece because that was really one of the driving factors behind going to the block where maybe we want to have more time in a given class period where we can have those, those hands-on experiences. So, but, you know, what you just covered, what Jody covered in for, with, the, with the grant, right? How do we, how do we make those, those connections between what I'm learning in a history class and how it applies to a, to a given um, academy? And, so we want to continue to develop that. We want to work in our teams to uh, make those interdisciplinary connections to kind of add that flavor or the flair of, of the academy. And, and that's just going to be something that's going to be part of our every year learning as we get deeper into the, into the academy model. And it's learning how to engage our, our partners. And I think right now for our teachers, I think a very reasonable place for us to be right now is you know, we're, we're still learning as teachers. Uh, opportunities that we have coming up, we're gonna be having some externship opportunities that we did a little bit in October. We're gonna be doing some more this summer to, you know, again, like I said, I was at Entrust this morning. How do we get teachers to really see kind of that outside world? Because if I'm a teacher, I need to understand that before I can really implement that to, with a high degree of fidelity in the classroom. And each of our uh, industry councils at their last meeting mm -hmm. committed to offering yeah. some type of short term, like half day to no more than two mm -hmm. days opportunities this summer for teachers to do like little mini externships mm -hmm. to get out and, and get into the businesses, mm -hmm. kind of keep developing that relationship. Right. And then the last one we have there is the continued development of those small learning communities. You know, we mentioned in the successes how well we're doing having our ninth graders be a part of that freshman academy. Well, as we go into the block schedule and we're developing the master schedule, is we want to, you know, again, one of the main purposes of why we did that as we're developing it, that we have, you know, students have teachers who they're building relationships with, not just over a, a nine week or an 18 week period, but over the course of a high school career within that um, academy. So, um, that is obviously something that's on the front of our radar, especially as we're going into a new schedule to really make sure that we are, that we're measuring that, that we're keeping those, those small learning communities intact. And finally, Sarah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, in, in the report there was a, there, you know, it's a 14 page report, but you know, you, you read it and, and you know, as the principal, you go through the, you know, you kind of skip the successes and you go right to the areas, of, you know, right? It's like, okay, what do we need to do? Human nature. And, and, and you know, to be full disclosure, you know, you, you, you go through it and you read the areas and, it, and it, it can feel overwhelming the first time you read it, right? But you realize that this is, this is a process and we're gonna be in implementation for, for a couple of years. But then you get to the conclusion, and you know that was a quote that Star said: we're, "We're making tremendous strides toward a collective transformation to wall-to-wall -wall academy." So you read all that, and then you read the conclusion, and, and it says, "You know what? We're we're where we're supposed to be." 
you know, we, we are, uh, you know, I think there was another quote we could put in there that, you know, as long as we are being forward and we're, you know, looking at the areas that, okay, being really mindful of those steps to the next level and, and where we can improve, um, you know, she said there's, there's no reason why we can't be a, a beacon school in the Ford MGL network. So, um, lots that we've accomplished, a lot more we need to do, but uh, it's, it's there. she's a great resource to have to be able to help us keep everything moving. So, I think we're doing good. Any questions? Well, there's one that I'm especially interested in the common time that teachers within the academy have to talk about students. Do you have any sense of how that's going? It seems like that would be yeah, something yeah. high school teachers always wanted and never had. Yeah, first of all, they, they love it, right? They have having that time built into the day. And so what we're doing right now is we meet, we meet twice a week. We do Tuesdays and Thursdays. So Tuesday, the Tuesday meeting, you know, that might be that time when we're talking about authentic instruction or some interdisciplinary opportunities or general academy of business, you know, business in general. And then Thursday are the meetings where we're having those, the intervention, those discussions about kids. And, and what in year one, what we're really building on is creating those systems, you know, thinking that, okay, if I'm in an academy, and let's say I've got between three to 400 students in an academy, is creating those efficient systems. So yeah, we're meeting every Thursday, but we want to make sure that we are having as many discussions about as many kids as possible, right? And when we're having those discussions, what are the different the different avenues, right? What for for intervention and how are we helping students? And I, and I think that's that's going to be continuous. And, you know, that's what we've learned from Nashville is that you don't come out of the gates in year one and you have it one hundred percent figured out. Um, but I think for me, that's that's a tremendous high value, right? Because that really is, that's the essence of creating the small community within a large high school is that you're building those relationships with kids and you have people, you know, we could be, we could be a team right here and we could be talking about, yep, you know, Timmy Johnson is someone who we have and we all know, right? Here's his strengths, his weaknesses. And, and I see that, I, I visit the different team meetings and, and it's, it's great to see those. I think what we all want is, we just want to be as efficient as possible being able to do that. But the, again, that teaming piece is, has been a highlight. Great. Because when you do that, then you can start, then it opens up the discussion of, okay, what do we do building-wide and system-wide, and what can we implement that's gonna benefit? It just opens up a whole new conversation and it creates more opportunities to help kids. We trained all staff in teaming over the summer, and then oh. we've actually had uh, the primary trainer came back and sort of did some progress monitoring, which then Star followed up mm -hmm. on in January as well so and that was all through Ford as well mm -hmm. training. great with the quote up there um, <coughs> the wall to wall part right? mm -hmm. are we still unique in that we have the full Academy model under one roof or have other schools been able to so wall to wall just means every student is in an Academy okay because there's lots of districts that have what are called pocket academies yeah. which is it's a choice for some kids not all kids um, as far as we know, and I recently talked to Julie Christ about this too, the superintendent at Alexandria, we, we think the only two in the state of Minnesota that have wall-to-wall -wall is Alexandria High School and Shakopee High School. Okay. So, and how many academies is that? Uh, they only three? have, a, they have the freshman academy plus three. Yep, career academies, three. But they're half our, less than half of our size. They're not actually affiliated with four. No. They, they didn't, they didn't something join. Something. Yeah, you have it, you you would know this, Reggie. You have to apply and be accepted right. into the network. And um, at the time, they chose not to apply because in the early part of the Ford network, they were looking for um, districts that are closer to the capitals of the states that they're in because they're in I don't know 23 yeah. states now or something like that. Right. But they've kind of broadened that since. Um, so. Um, Julie Crest and actually their high school principal Chad was here during the designation ceremony so they're they're having some more we're talking with them again about how to continue our collaboration with them which has been very helpful to us and then I they think they're they've been having discussions before too now how long have they been in the longer than us um, so they they designed their building around the model just like uh, we did and I think this would be I'm trying to think because I saw the building mm -hmm. i'm looking at sarah it no. seems like it's five or six 14, years that five for sure i think yep. like five or six years yeah, would be six. my guess could be six okay. mm -hmm. i have a question for nancy 
you just said every kid is part of the academy models. Mm -hmm. How does a special ed kid pick an academy if they're not Google? Mm -hmm. Do the parents pick that? to look at him because they do the registry. Yeah, yeah I, I, think with that, I, I think that would be part of the team. That would, you know, you definitely would want to get parent input because what you're going to do, you know, like, like any student, you want to draw on interests, right, and strengths. And so, uh, so you know, I, I would say whether you're verbal or nonverbal, right, there's, there's an advocate there and there's, and there's ways to find that out because that, that's really what we want is kids being in a place where they feel this is this is cool. This is interesting. So, do all the special ed kids go through a teaming process as well? Because I know some special ed kids go to classes, mm -hmm. and some kids are just housed with one teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if you're just with that one teacher, are you still part of the teaming process? Oh yeah, we have because on our teams we have our teams are representative. So we're we're set up where we have special ed teachers. We have yes, yeah, so we have mainstream and special ed teachers are a part of are tied to each of the academies. Now, now you start getting into that, you know, the purity piece, right? Because if I'm a case manager, I, you know, you're going to go with what the students want to have, and so, as if I'm a sped teacher, I could be cross-sectioning. But what we what we want to do in the building is we want to create as much as, as pure as possible, right? We want to create that team, that team atmosphere, and it's it's not exclusive to to, to gen ed or or just med ed. It, it's it's all of our kids. Yeah. I have one question in regards to future. Um, at what point uh, would Shakopee consider thinking about adding an academy? Because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, we have a, a great cross section of, of careers, um, but obviously there are some that are missing. Maybe it's more of the construction trade type of academy. Uh, maybe that's not what it is, but to incorporate more of those classes. So we have uh, construction is is actually embedded in the engineering manufacturing uh, academy. So there's a whole uh, program of study around construction. Um, I think what we've always assumed is that based at once we have a better sense of enrollment patterns, which are changing quite a bit with all the changes we're making, uh, that it might be necessary to either collapse a program of study or, uh, like you said, uh, pick a different program of study within an academy um, to actually close one academy to make you know, physically, the way the build is, building is set up is unless we would add another tower, which is possible. Um, we have kind of the seven locations set up for the physical presence of seven academies. So, um, you know, I would say that would be, I, I could see more ch changing in what is the programs of study within an academy versus maybe uh, unless we would have an academy that just is not doing well at all completely changing to a whole new different academy sure. which could possibly happen I mean that's what we're going to find out over the next few years right is what what's what they vote when they register so we're going to see um, but so far I think even because uh, our freshmen did choose here recently mm -hmm. yep. I think we found a pretty equal distribution again right we did yeah I, I want to just I'm just going so to remember good. here but you know uh, health science again like this year was the most students but, but I want to see our spread I want to say health science might be a tick over 400 and then the smalls were talking in the low 300s so we're still that's that's great you know, and, yeah and and and, and, uh, and again you know the way that we did that process is you know we want to capture the kids who are all in and then we'll ask a question of you know on six of one half a dozen of the other we, we, we try to question it in a way that we're really capturing what kids want could we get last year we got a breakdown of where mm -hmm. the kids chose and by their basic demographics as well. I, I found oh, sure. it pretty fascinating. So if we could get their report. Mm -hmm. Speaking of registration, I had the pleasure of signing off on my daughter's registration. It was really exciting for me to <laughs> see this all come to life and come to reality and and she's trying two AP classes, which I was gritting my teeth on, but I'd rather have her reach and, yeah. and try. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's just so fun to see putting the puzzle pieces together and all those things are it's, it was more exciting for me than for her. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it, it, you know, and, and as a parent, I have a middle school parent, you know, and I, I see, I, I just see the simple questioning where you, you know, 
the, the gateway, you know, it's like every time we call out of a gateway course, there's a new career that I want to do, right? <laughs> and and uh, But then she'll think of new things, and she'll ask, well, Dad, if I want to do this, is it tied, you know, is it more in this academy or this academy? And it just shows it, it just, our, our middle school students, are, they're thinking about it, right? And, it, and that's, hey, if we're changing from one to the, that's okay, it means we're exploring, yeah. right? That's so, right. yeah. Good question. Were there many students who chose an academy and, and didn't get that one? No, you know what what we did is it, it, I should there's an appeal process to, to everything and, and so what we do on that questionnaire is is we do you know I, I want to know if I'm a student I'm 100 percent business and entrepreneurship and if I can't do it you know it's that or bust the second question we designed it was and, and I think some to you know you get some students that kind of read it where well, it's my number two choice but the the one question is you know we wanted to capture if I'm 50% this and 50% that, you know, in other words, I would do either of these, then what we did with that question, we used that to kind of help balance things out, right? But I know some students thought, well, it meant that was my number two, but whether you misunderstood, you know, that doesn't matter, just do an appeal and then give a reason why, and then we take, those, we take that back. And then, as you can see, we, we're not so worried about if they have to be 100%, you know, because we, we knew we were gonna have windows and, uh, you know, it's okay, health science is, is all right, we're still capturing a small community. Um, but I, I, I would say at the end of the day, because now we're into the registration process, is I'd, I'd like to say we got kids where they want to be. Yeah, yeah. That's my son's biggest concern. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do if I don't get into the academy I want? Mm -hmm. We put a lot of time into that last year on how we want to word that survey and how we want to capture that. You know, because you don't, you don't want to, Again, you, you know, you need to choose, but we wanted to try to get as many an idea. Okay, what what are you what are you thinking? Just as you would, just, just if you were an artist, what are you thinking, right? And so we try, you know, when you're doing that with thousands of students, you, you know, you try to do that the, the best you can. Because we all know the whole uh, idea behind this is that you know you want to get kids where they're at, but we also know too that we can't have uh, you know 2,700 kids in one academy, either, right. right? So yeah. So one comment and, and two quick questions. The, the comment you answered the question I was going to ask: How's the choosing going for next year? Mm -hmm. And the comment is that was my biggest concern the last time. I've been through this whole process. What happens if everybody just goes after this one? And our distribution was quite great last year, and I was thrilled to just hear you say mm -hmm. that the new kids picking mm -hmm. it's the same thing. That to me is a that's two data points that that mm -hmm. now starts to create a trend, and I, I really like that. So I applaud that. Two questions, Sarah. Can you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. I think there's. A, Pretty easy question. The first one is: Is there any kind of timing? Actually, let me ask a different question first. Am I correct in assuming these aren't so much deficiencies? This is truly how we continue to grow and yeah. develop and progress. She calls it next level next because level. that's some of the next steps or next right. things you need to. It's not that we get it wrong. It's just here's the evolution of the program. Is sure. That safe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then the question is: The second question is timing. Is there a time for? I mean, transition to the block. That's kind of time bound because we're going there. Right. But do we have a window to do these things, or are these like, hey, you need to get these done in the next six months to a year? Or I remember back when we started this, several things were a few years long in accomplishing. Are any of these, you know, time bound? I, I know um, I, I can speak at least of this first one. Star felt, and I think Mike probably felt it too, some sense of urgency to make sure that our summer retreat was yeah. as it was and intended to be. You know, in fairness to our steering committee, um, the, there was kind of a long planning process prior to implementation. And then, you know, we were dealing with a variety of, of factors around, you know, uh, just this, uh, you know, pushing to keep the support high for the academy model, those kinds of things. And so she just felt, feels really strongly that that one, we need to really work to make sure that they, um, that we're really living up to true partnership, which is that the, that the steering committee is helping us as an external uh, piece to ensure that we're doing true fidelity to the implementation plan. And that that's one of the things that makes it truly sustainable is that the community is helping us on an ongoing basis and it's not um, like an advisory council yeah. or, you know. So I know she felt some strong urgency to that. I don't know if Mike wants to speak to that or not. But. She did and she shared that and that was, and it was good. And I think we, you know, I'm a fresh set of eyes in a lot of ways and we went in and uh, wanted to make sure that, yep, 
there, there was that sense of urgency, and uh, you know, if you're in the implementation stage, here are the you know, here are the the uh, tasks for the steering committee, and how they would suggest that they're structured, and we've gone to work on that, and I uh, feel we're we're headed in the, the right direction, and we'll certainly meet those time targets as well. Okay. Well, it all sounds terrific. Thank you for the update. Good work going. All right. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to uh, FY19 budget revisions and FY20 budget assumptions. Talk money. Jeff, All right. our money man. Jeff, do you have it? You have it? I have it. Can I grab yeah, it? That's yeah. probably quicker. So what I want to talk about are, uh, we're, we're going to be looking at our governmental funds. There's two funds we would uh, propose making some budget revisions for this current year, so in the 18-19 uh, budget year. And then we're well into the way of planning for uh, the 1920 budget, and we'll uh, share the assumptions we have in place for uh, within the general fund. So if we look at... Uh, the adapted budget, so this is the budget, the governmental funds portion uh, that the board approved back in June. Uh, so it's it's our fiscal year, July 1 through June 30, 2019. Um, see the projected revenue, uh, expenses, and then projected uh, fund balance. So if you were looking at the budget book, the difference here is that in the beginning uh, fund equity, I've inserted the audited fund balances versus when we approved the budget, it was a projection on, on where things would end up. So that's the only difference there. Then we get into the assumptions, and uh, I think we shared this with the Board of Finance uh, a week or so ago. Um, overall, the assumptions are, when you look at um, you know, $100 million of revenue and expense, Total, um, the adjustments are, are pretty minimal. That is Delta. Um, but I think they're important to review because they um, are dealing with enrollment and uh, and then staff costs, which are, uh, I guess I've got it through it, but staff costs account for 82% of general fund expenditures. So you can see that piece. So uh, general fund revisions. So there's an enrollment adjustment. The next page, I'll kind of uh, do a summary of you know what we're looking at, and why we're making that adjustment. Basically, our enrollment is less than projected, um, and most of that is at the uh, at the elementary level. Then we're doing an adjustment, positive adjustment on the revenue side for categorical aid, special education. Um, I think we we work with a model from. Uh, Department of Education to try to project special education revenue. Um, I, I think I would say that it will be probably April of this, April 19, when we know what we really got for special education from this prior. So, so, not that we're chasing a number, I think we're pretty close here, but, uh, but we're making that adjustment at this point in time. Then, uh, there's a revenue adjustment. It's uh, one of our funding components, the pension revenue. Um, that's a result of an increase to our teacher retirement contribution. That flows through on the staffing updates uh, as well. So we're projecting the, the slight increase in, in the district uh, share of teacher retirement. Uh, so 100000 on 
revenue, and then when we look at that staffing update, 117. That's also included um, in that number. We've got a small state grant that uh, we didn't know about when we brought the budget to the board. Uh, 75,000 in revenue, 75,000 in expense, and then the staffing update uh, reflects the pension adjustment. So once we go through and put in all of the new staff, all of the changes, um, we're kind of doing that by line item, by benefit category. We adjust the budget downward, 117,000. Then um, utilities expense, that's one I think I told the board finance. When we finish the audit, we typically will go through, I'll go through kind of line item by line item, and where do we kind of miss the budget? Um, and it's in our utilities expense, and I went back, it's, it's not because we added square footage to the high school, because we, well, I, we've, just, we've just missed on that number. I'm going back three, four years, so let's adjust it to where, where it needs to be. Um, I can use a formula with like a dollar per square foot for electricity, 40 some cents for gas. And, um, so this will get us to where, where the actual expense is going to be. We had a uh, workers' comp renewal in November and uh, actual expenses for our workers' comp insurance for the year will decrease by 30000 So again, um, I think I talked to the board finance, do I really even need to we're talking $35,000 decrease in revenue, $78,000 increase in expense, and a $100 million budget. Uh, but to me, what's important are those, especially those areas of enrollment and staff costs that um, we need to go in and adjust those, look at that regardless. But in total, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Jeff, but I want to yeah. make this point. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. Roughly $110,000 on a $100 million budget is one tenth of one percent, right? Yeah, I mean that's yeah. just phenomenal to make for that being the revisions in mid-year. Kudos to you guys in terms of your plan. Yeah, I don't feel too bad bringing it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> if we got to ten percent, it'd probably be someone else here. For ten percent, one tenth of one percent. That's phenomenal. So, so now next year it has to come from one hundred oh, yeah. percent. Yeah. 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 Sure, that'll happen. All right. <laughs> then the other uh, the other fund in the governmental funds, capital project fund revisions. Um, I think last year we had a care the total that well total dollar amount was about eight and a half million. Um, we just didn't spend that due to time. It's not that. So this is the fund that's funding the high school expansion and a few other uh, capital projects. So it's eventually going to work its way to zero. Um, we just thought we would be spending $1.4 million sooner. Didn't happen, so obviously at June 30th, fund balance is a little bit higher, but it's going to happen this year, so, so we're adding that. Um, and that's reflected here then, what we call our revised budget. Uh, audit again, same audited, better be the same audited balances at the beginning, and then I just read the items involved are that where the revisions are, are flowing through. Um, let's look at the chart for the fund equity. Um, and it's nice to be able to look at the um, FY19. If we look at the restricted fund, you can see where that was a couple years ago. Uh, approaches $1.5 million. And over to the unassigned, um, that should be, let me go back here and take a look. Uh, I guess I've got total fund balance, but anyway, over 2.6 million dollars. So, uh, so some improvement and some good improvement in district equity. So, questions on revision. So, what I'd like to do then is we'll bring that to the board at the end of February and actually have you act on it, so I can go in and put that into the finance system. Jeff, just uh, if you can go back up one yep. slide yep. above the graph. Sorry, the next one. I'm sorry. Um, on the debt service, yeah. I just I want to refresh my thinking. I think it's good yeah. for us to talk about free money. That's basically a pass, right? We, we, yeah. Before that, we pay down bond commitments. Um, what would we say if somebody said, "Can you spend that down to you know two hundred thousand? And would we save any money if we were to roll that fund balance into 
paying earlier, is that not an option or is it wise? Probably, it probably not an option. We okay. have to follow our amortization schedule. But you're exactly right. That funds um, has the, the tax levy that comes in to pay to pay down our our bonded debt. Uh, it'll usually have a, a fund balance. Uh, sometimes we'll approach five percent. And it's there, kind of, you levy, we, we're required to levy 5% right. um, more. And then if there's debt excess, the MD actually looks at the fund balance, we probably wouldn't let that go to six million and they'll reduce our, and that's happened yep. Yep, to the district as well. So but you kind of build a fund balance because there, in a year there might be some delinquent taxes, abatements, and we need to be able to meet our, our debt obligations. Okay. Questions on uh, yeah, yeah. big revision for the yeah. revised budget. I'm, I'm assuming going off this uh, graph that we have those funds in the bank. We have those funds available to spend for the budget increase. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I'm understanding your question, but are you saying as well, far as Go ahead. Brent. Well, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Are you saying are the are they real dollars? Yeah. They're not just on paper. They're real dollars that if, if yes. something catastrophic happened, we would have it to spend. Correct. Is that? And I assume the answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. You're talking about the fund balance. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's available, but it, but fund balance and cash in the bank can be two different things. Um, at the end of the year, we might have a receivable from the state of Minnesota of six and a half million dollars. So we recognize that as revenue, and it, it projects out to that yeah, fund equity. So it's not always it's not always cash in the bank, but it's but it is a real uh, legitimate equity of the of the school district. <laughs> Jeff, it's safe to say if we summed everything up and we and went out of business, that would be left over yeah. at the end. Yeah. So it's but. it's a kind of it takes our receivable from MDA federal uh, receivable, and then we have payments. So we and those are on the books. So all of that combined assets liabilities equal here. And we're, and we're not planning Fund about that's, 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 Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. But I was also going to say during a school year, the revenues and expenditures do not come in in any type of consistent order and and some of that fund balance is used when the revenue hasn't been realized from the state and so it, it covers you know it gets you through the year but if you were able to stop and total it all up that would be you know in essence in a bank account yeah so uh, yeah as of june 30 when we stop and total it all up that's what we're projecting for okay fund balance. jeff to go along with that at any point during the government shutdown does that affect school districts <coughs> No, I think there was some concern about some food service, federal food, but yeah. we never got to that point. So at least the first. How long does it take first, to get to that point? So the first, what's that? How long does it take to get to that point? I think they were talking about maybe March or April. We would see. So, so we never we didn't approach it. Okay. Jeff, before you dig into the fiscal twenty budget, I know we talked about. You, the revised budget had a change of one tenth of one percent. I just want to tell you something about Jeff, which he'll probably be mad at me for sharing. He was frustrated by that a little bit and, wanted, and, and went back and revisited everything. And, I mean, seriously, that but you know, which is great. That's exactly what we want. And you know, I, I don't know if you'd ever be completely happy unless it was zero. Yeah, so I, I appreciated that kind of uh, you know really going after it. And, but, and, that was great. Yeah, thanks. But maybe for a new board member. So if you think about it, um, going back to that staffing update, so you don't necessarily have to come back and update that, but um, but we're bringing a, a budget to you in May, June, and it's based on staff who are here right now, and we've moved them up on the salary schedule. And not all of those staff, some people retire, some people leave. So you've got now teacher A that's, you know, we had this person, BA 30, step four, but the new person is BA 15, step. So we, I go through that and uh, and adjust all those numbers. So, but I appreciate so you're always going to have 
But I appreciate the meticulous nature you, with which you do your work and the high standards you hold yourself and your team yeah. to. So thank you. Thank, thank you. We all appreciate yes. that. Thank yes. you for saying that. Yeah. Especially with like graphs like that that are up into the right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> We're always been the last couple of years with some significant yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's nice to see a very modest one. Okay. All right. So. As I said, we're also starting to work on the budget for next year that will, 1920, that will have you approve in um, June and time frame. So right now, and I'll go through the assumptions that, that get us to these numbers, um, we're for general fund only, uh, we're projecting 99670000 in revenue, uh, expenditures of 99.6, so we are uh, projecting a surplus. Pretty small surplus when you're talking hundred million dollars, but a surplus uh, nonetheless. And you um, tend to take, as you have, a conservative approach. Yeah, this I would. I would say. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what you kind of need. So what's what's built in there on the revenue side? So there's a thing called basic general education aid. Uh, it's an amount that comes as paid per student. Or saying that that's going to go up 2% to 6,438. Uh, that provides 58 million of that 99 million. So it is a significant number in our budget. When are we going to find out that dollar amount? <laughs> we will find out when the legislature finishes right, their work. So there are times where you have to approve a budget by July 1. Right. So if there's been a few sessions. times where we're in extended yeah. session and hey board, approve this budget. We think it's going to be two percent, but maybe we don't know. Might be all in July. We might not know. Yeah. So Mike, have you been can you hearing anything? I mean, there's lots of articles in the paper about changing the, the formulas and. It's still very early. It's on the platform for a lot of organizations. You know, MASA and AMSD you know, and, and others like that are looking for three and three on the formula and an inflation adjustment, but. You know whether that would ever come to fruition or not. There's a lot that has to play out. Uh, so at this point, it's still pretty early. Bills are being introduced now that actually contain that word, exact wording, but a long way from passage by two houses or two bodies of the legislature and then being signed by the governor. I did want to point out Joe's point is really well taken, and it's a challenge for Jeff's job and our job is. Earlier in a slide, you saw that 82% of the budget goes to staffing. Well, we're contractually obligated to take care of staffing needs, typically well before the legislature uh, finalizes the budget for next year, which is a really, really tough challenge. So, yeah, and in, with the school funding, it's easy to focus on the two and two, right? Like it has been the last few cycles. Well, last cycle was two and two with nothing on the categoricals. The the other funding. So it was kind of a hollow two and two because the previous two and two had included significant funding for the special ed and the other category. So it, it, we all get fixated on just the number, but it's that's the baseline. Well, and, and you hit another great point. When, it, when they say two and two, you assume it's two percent across the board. Well, it's two percent of the general fund, which is about sixty percent of the budget. So if it doesn't hit the categoricals or that other forty percent of the budget. Two and two is actually 1.2 and 1.2, yeah. which doesn't keep up with the you know, rate of inflation cost of, you know, kind of cost of that. So. One thing that I'm, I've been watching myself is the bill that Senator Pratt, I think, is carrying um, for special ed reform, which maybe lowers some of the administrative costs with possibly additional funding, I believe, from what I've seen. But anyone else? Yeah, there's some, the cross subsidy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're here. So we, you know, we have been hearing the three and three. Uh, I guess why did we pick two? Kind of look at the, the history there, going back to 1516. It's been two. So, but we'll monitor that. It's Obviously, if it yeah, changes, you don't plan it's on three and three. And three and up with two. If it's in law by the time we approve the budget, we'll have made those. Yeah. Well, made those. And I can't remember the last time it was above two. Yeah. yeah. I know. I can remember a few years where. Last. Didn't change. Yeah. 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 Hey, I can figure out that. <laughs> so, in some years, we'll, we'll wait six months. So, uh, so, and I think, like you're talking about some of the other components uh, of the gen. And when I say formula driven, 
for the most part, I mean, there it's a dollar amount attached to our enrollment. So if we're good on our enrollment, these numbers, and if the, if the legislative number uh, changes as we assume, then we would be close there. Property tax revenue, fairly easy because you already approved that in um, in December. So we, when you did that in December, that's for the, it's called property tax payable in 19 for the 1920 school year. So we had that plus or minus uh, delinquent taxes, a few miscellaneous taxes, but for the most part it will be uh, in that area. And, and then, sorry, just to yep. interject there. If somebody builds a million dollar home now, that's not taxable until 20. Anyways, We're not going right? to see that. that. That number's a fixed number. Yeah, it's a fixed number. Yeah. Yep. You certify the levy at that 15.3, and that's that's the certified levy. So, um, other state categorical, we're showing 13.6. Uh, biggest chunk there is is special education. It's probably about I think I've got 9.9 .9 million built into that number. So, federal revenue sources. I'm just leaving it at current year. Uh, that's what we've got in the current year. And then, um, we saw so that's kind of big picture revenue. And then um, personnel, staff personnel costs, 82% of our expenditures. Uh, but it's important, as, I'm just gonna read this, board approved positions from the current year are rolled forward to the 1920 fiscal year. So what we're saying is, we're not looking at, there's pro, people who love to expand this program, a lot of good reasons to do a lot of those great things for kids and expand programs, but we're saying under our tight, uh, our budget constraints, we're not looking at making any changes. So there are no staffing changes anticipated in the preliminary budget, except as may be required due to enrollment fluctuations. So, so sorry, two, what, two questions. Yep. Number, I'm assuming when you say roll forward, you're like you outlined oh, before, it's another step, possibly another Step one. in some. Yeah. Maybe some inflationary increase due to contract negotiation. And then, as you talked about, enrollment fluctuation in a couple of those hot spots that it comes time to August, and we'll look at, like yep. we've got a kindergarten class that's above above our guidelines. Do we have a contingency built in for that, or would that be additional spending, non-budgeted? At that point? I, I would say that um, this year we we have a it's probably by default built in because um, I'm just taking the current staff. Okay. And again, remember, one of the revisions we're making is an enrollment adjustment. So we've got fewer kids, but I'm rolling that step forward. I'm making the changes, kind of anticipating what enrollment will be. So it's we'll get closer and clean it up more as we go through the budgeting process. But right now, I would say there's there's some changes in the Thank you. Um, so these are the student staff ratios. Gave you a different name for that. that maybe target. 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 No, I put target there. What does it say? It says target. target. Well, I know, but then on the grid it shows. <laughs> it says target. And uh, see the same thing for uh, middle school and high school. And then, can you see those? That can be. Uh, so when you look at general fund, 82 percent, um, you know, then we've got instructional supplies, we've got some utilities, uh, but non-staff expenditures are 22 million, representing 22.4 percent of the general fund. So it's all about where the staff costs kind of go and end up. Um, and then I just break out instructional supply allocations or leaving the per pupil unit allocation for instructional supplies at the same level that it's at um, currently. Uh, transportation contracted services, I will tell you that we think, we know we can reduce about four routes just based on load counts without changing any service quality. That is built in here, so that's, building that in kind of helps us balance that budget. Um, cushion payments, I think we're estimating with a little bit of an inflator. And that yeah, mentioned supply budgets the same amount. So routing efficiencies will provide for a reduction of four regular routes. So um, that's kind of where we are right now. Well, again, we monitor the legislature. We know the um, governor's recommendations will be coming out, I think, in about a week. And then we get the February forecast. So 
towards the end of the month. So we'll ask you to approve these, and that's where we start. Uh, but we'll be monitoring and changing. And hopefully the legislature's done when we get to June to ask you to approve the budget and get some good numbers. I question. That 82% is that more or less than in any same size district? Uh, it's it is it's it's 81 to 82. I would say in every district. So yeah, that's amazing. Well, not really. I mean, it's the that's that's the nature of our business. So, uh, but I've seen that. That's the level that yeah, pretty much anybody is. Question for Joe. Well, I was just saying, and, and Joe, that's a conundrum with, you know, people, you know, they think of school and they think of a building. And when they go, and you have to make cuts, it's really challenging to make cuts because the school is really the people. 82% of our expenditures are going to staff. And so that's, you know, I, I think a lot of times people don't understand that cuts involve people. There, there is very, very little outside of people. You know, we think of supplies and those other things around the building. Um, that, all of that makes up 18%. You know, that's the heating oil and that's all those things. And so I just. No, trust me, I know. So I, I know. I want to say yeah. my company, it's probably 70% yeah. or more is with, with uh, you know, compensation, benefits, and, and taxes. So it, it makes sense to me. Other questions? Questions? Yeah. Jeff, about the lower enrollment, um, I can see that 60 out of how many students we have in school isn't many, but is that usual or is that an area? Yeah. Um, we I think we'll I think we'll do a better job this year. Um, I think that as I look, I think what I look at is when I got here, we had a model over here that we were using, the enrollment projection model. I think that we weren't meshing with people maybe doing staffing and building, so. That's that shows up here that that we weren't meshed together, but that's not how we're working it going forward. So, so we but it's not a big one swing. Yeah, that's kind of is that yeah, pretty you know, usual that you're going to have that much of a discrepancy one I way or the other? I think that's pretty significant. Yeah, to come and say it's a 400. And, yeah, I think that's pretty significant. And I guess what I'm really saying is that an issue of how you figure out <coughs> the enrollment, or is an issue about how we're serving people? I, I, I'm wondering I if somewhere how, we should be I asking questions. I think it's questions. how we were doing it, and I just okay. think we, right? I'll say my department had a, had a model, and I thought we were all on board, but I was kind of new here, so oh, this group was over here Systems looking at these numbers. So, so we know that will be flushed up. And is there a benefit we're doing another? We just did one last fall, last summer for an enrollment study. Yeah, we did a demograph. That helps. That helps. But we still, yeah. That's kind of. Still have the, the, the kindergarten number kindergarten. is the biggest wild card sure. for us. Sure. So we just don't know. We have an idea. It doesn't vary wildly, but it varies. Got it. Go ahead. Well, as I was going to say, I, I think this past year was the first year of what I would say is a, a sophisticated staffing model and we've gone back and taken a look at that and like Dave alluded to the kindergarten projection is is challenging in that and I think there was there's six or seven different ways of calculating that we're digging into that and then also trying to take a look at are there patterns of attrition and addition throughout the year and some, you know, and we've got, I think, is it 19 years now of kind of historic data? Really, the last four or five were pulled um, to take a look at those patterns and even see if we can tighten that up. But that's that's challenging work, and we've, we've got that'll take some time and effort. But what I've seen, my observation, looking at the staffing side of things, you know, Keith and Dave have done a lot of work there. The finance side of things with Jeff over the last two, three weeks, they've spent a lot of time together making sure those systems are meshed, that it's a, they're sharing the same information, and then we're going to face those challenges of attrition or addition and how to project the kindergarten together. And yeah, it might be part of, you know, there, there might be, uh, you know, some aspect of an enrollment study. I know I've met uh, this past week with somebody from the county. They've got, you know, pretty accurate numbers of, of kids age zero to four that we don't always, we're not always privy to that access. We get them when they sign up in the school district. So we're trying to see if, 
you know, we can share some of that data where we could make a more accurate projection based on actual numbers rather than trends or perceptions. And, and we've got a, what is that, the GIS the study? We've got, uh, you know, Dave and I are going to look at some of those even trends too with, with the company that, that we use. So. Are we currently in kindergarten enrollment right now? Are we currently yeah. in kindergarten enrollment? Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Have you, have you seen any numbers above the top? Yeah. We haven't done that yet. So. What are they after? We're just getting started. Right? It's probably just. It's <coughs> well, they, they, they've, they've launched it, all right, I think. But yeah. usually, I mean, this is now when we're just starting to get numbers in, in the next month or two. And just for some scale. They usually start with the packet that they send out. And they the packets were sent out uh, two weeks ago? There you go. I'm ahead of schedule. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's you know, I maybe just add, I got I think I mentioned it for finance, but I got it. I was presenting enrollment uh, in another district, and someone said, well, Why don't you just get up and go out to the buildings and count your kids, and then you come back and tell so, them? So, just so you know, there's there, I mean, it, it changes every day. So it's, you know, we could have this many kids on September 1st and this many in June. And it's kind of prorated throughout the year. We've got attrition. We've got tuition payments for students, uh, open enrollment. So it's all those things that, that make up that number. And we don't, you know, when the auditors are here, it's the fall. Um, so fall of 18, we're, we're saying this is how many students we had. So we're going to count for this much revenue, we don't really nail that number from the Department of Ed until probably the end of December. And it's kind of fixed. So and that's for the that's for the prior year. So um, Welcome to school if it was as easy as <laughs> as just going out today tomorrow and counting kids, I could come back and say, here's our revenue. Well and even and we do look at, you know, we're we're constantly looking at the enrollment throughout the year and looking for patterns and even registrations and seeing is there a pattern, what percentage were registered on this date. But again that budget will be improved in June. Families will move in and out, register after uh, you know, they're moving in with younger kids or older kids and, and there's just you know and our numbers are within that type of a range. We're not talking you know, the, to kind of second register, we're not talking enormous numbers, but right. there's a lot of factors that drive that. Yeah. A swing of 60 is less than 1%. <coughs> it sounds like a lot when you think yeah, about 60 it's kids, but it's a big number at $400,000. <laughs> right. it, 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 it turns into the dollar. Yeah. Yeah. What is the impact of uh, open enrollment? Is there a deadline uh, for students that want to transfer from one district to another? Yeah, I don't know the exact. January 15th. Okay. So we know those numbers. Sarah's shaking her head. We're an integration district. Oh, sorry. So we have no deadline. Yeah. We have no deadline. We're an integration district. We receive A and I funds. So we and we have more students going out than coming. In. Correct. All right. So we have a very small revision. We're making a nice addition to our fund balances, so it's going to be a very productive year. And the look for FY20 is small surplus, but that's conservative, so that's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Budget. Yeah. I'd say it's a great update. Thanks for yeah. the Okay. And Thanks. I know we're jumping ahead to the David Keith show, but I mean, the no staffing adjustments is a big part. Yeah, yeah. You know, kind of leads into there. A uh, big part. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you bet. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So with that, it's up to you guys. <laughs> Dave and Keith, you guys want to come on now? Oh, Dave's already up here. Oh, Dave's going to change, change sheets. Change seats. Yeah, try again. Yeah. What am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be coming with here. Wow. Out of order. <laughs> You're rolling yourself. I've never done that. Or him. Or him. <laughs> I've never done that. That was a fun. serious throw He deserved it. <laughs> I, I got it. Actually, I got it, Sarah. That's oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Can you put his graphic up there? I can. I, um, I, Jeff, uh, I, I need to lock that kid in. Oh, okay. So for anyone watching, preliminary staffing is the topic. Yes. Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit about the enrollment. Okay. Right. So as far as preliminary staffing, what we're really going to talk about is the process we use. It's beyond what Jeff showed with the or communicated that we're rolling staff forward. We're not 
projecting any specific numbers here tonight. We're going to show you kind of the tool that we use to do that that's based on enrollment and kind of what the variables are. So it's really informational, but in the future we can uh, see actual numbers here. Cool. So, so first we're just going to talk to sort of the graphic of how we go about the process. So you guys have talked a little bit here about the establishment of the budget parameters. And then the question is, are we adding staff? That's part of the assumption in terms of the budget. Are we reducing staff? Or are we staying relatively the same? And I think what you've heard here tonight is Jeff saying, we're anticipating staying relatively the same. But it, the, the arrows going both ways sort of indicate that student enrollment really drives budget, right? I mean, that each, I, I've been in districts where we talk about that's the backpack. Each kid has a little backpack of, $6,500 or whatever, but that, that sort of drives both things. And then when we look at student enrollment, we we typically have rolled each grade up, like first through 12, we roll up those numbers. Like David said, when he's sitting over there, about kindergarten numbers are really, we're, we're du we have been tending to duplicate the prior year's kindergarten, but it is awful awfully difficult to figure out. We've had some of those. This year we ran this model that Dave's going to show you for every school and we we have sort of seen that there was very little change. I think we were at the end of May, June, that enrollment pretty much was the same as it was moving forward so we can possibly make adjustments at that point in terms of our staffing. There was one school in particular that had a really had a 30, 30, 35 student increase in uh, kindergarten. So that shows you the unpredictability of it. But that's typically how we do the student, you know, how we look at how many kids are in there. That enrollment sort of drives what we're, this model is going to show you. Then some additional factors is the number of classes or credits a student takes, particularly at the secondary level, the number of classes per FTE that a teacher actually teaches. And then we get down to this whole class target idea, the number of students in a class and how large of a range will we tolerate. And we'll talk a little bit about that with the model that Dave's going to throw up. You want to let me mm -hmm. thank you for a second? So the, the easier one to understand the process is the um, elementary. So we'll start with that here. And the, these are these are not any particular school, but it'll give you an idea. So if I took an elementary school, we have a target for each of those um, uh, grade levels. And then we will start with, this is what we ended the year at. So for us right now, we could almost say for planning purposes, it's the end of 1819. So we said, this is how many kids we have, February 11th right now. And this is how many teachers we had at each. And this is what class sizes that generated for that. So this would be a snapshot of what is happening right now. Projecting forward, here's this real simple model. We move everybody up a grade. So 122 to first grade. This 125 goes from first to second and so forth. And we just use as a kindergarten prediction, a projection to start it, what we had last year. So this school, if you look at it, is graduating essentially a class of 149. They're bringing in a class with this projection of 122. They're dropping from 761 to 734, okay? Then what we actually start doing is running reports out of our system, okay? Starting in, in this model, you can see it started in April. So we projected at 122, kindergarten was at 95. And Keith, Natasha, and I all last summer ran these reports a lot and we tried to see what was happening and so uh, to not single out one building we we again these numbers are manufactured a little bit but it, it faces reality a little bit too. Look at all those deltas right? Yeah. <laughs> Lots of deltas yeah. I mean just from month to month you're talking about 20, 30 even when you're running it every 10 days, there's swings. Especially, again, it's the kindergarten in this case that changed a lot. But if you look here, this one's at 124 there. Six months, or 10, what would that be? Seven months later, you know, nine months later, they're at 122, they're two down, exactly the same, plus one, delta, no delta, plus five. 
Okay, so you can see those are pretty stable. In this example, the kindergarten number moved a lot. Even from, if you looked at the end of June, the kindergarten number moved a lot. So we were doing this because we wanted to respond as quickly as possible to where there's an issue. Here's how we kept track of this. We plug in the enrollments as they change and we watch what happens to the um, class targets. So this one at six sections is now into our, our caution zone, yellow. If they're two and a half above the target, at three more, and I'll just change this to 138, you'll see it then shows us, hey, you're there, now you're three over, you gotta start looking at this. If for some reason it dropped, it wouldn't do this like that, but let me go even lower than that, 100. We have something that kind of tells us just the, the you're overstaying. If we're, we have too much there, okay? And so, I'm gonna put this one back. That's the idea. That's it. And so the principals are watching, you know, that they have access to this model now too. There's always this question of what's happening, and so they have a close eye on how we do this. It, as you can see, it's driven by how many kids we have and what the target is. And then how many sections we allocate determines that. You say, should we make that, oops, should we make that a seven? That puts me a little bit below, but we're gonna ride with it at six for a little while until maybe we get another couple rounds in, okay? We also, off of these, calculate the number of specialists that it takes per um, section. And so they would wind up with about two phi ed, one and a half music, and so forth, okay? We roll all these up across our schools and we get total numbers, all right. Good on elementary? Okay, secondary, um, this, this is set up very similarly, okay? We have an initial uh, date where we kind of allocate their staffing to them. We, we give them an initial number. And the allocation they get off of this model is meant to cover their core classes, where they are in credits. In this model, we're assuming a kid can earn up to 14 credits a year. We're saying average due to study halls or other non-credit bearing courses that a kid earns is 13 and a half. Our target is 31 and a teacher can teach 10 credits of sections a year. That's what full time is. These variables right here, combined with how many kids we have, help us figure out our staff, okay? So off of these numbers, these initial numbers, this is the FTE they would need, okay? And th this is the formula, I, I don't, don't know if you care that much about maybe you, the formula, but it takes those four variables into account. Enrollment, class target, how many sections a teacher can teach, and um, what was the other one? I forgot. Of course, yeah. teach. Out of how many? Oh yeah, out of how many, how many credits they take, correct. Well, and that's something we, for those of us who are involved with the converting the block schedule and the teacher negotiations, going from a five out of seven period, we were 71% efficient. Going to a three out of four, you're 75% efficient. So you get, you actually gain efficiency and save money by going to a three out of four block schedule. Yes. And, we, and this will take care of that by just changing the, yeah. the maxes and how many they teach. What we did initially is we also put something in here to say initially we want to, we're not distributing 100% of the allocation, allocation out of the chute. So we say in this school, we'd allocate 43.2. You have kind of have a 0 0.7 buffer that we're holding on to for a little while to see what happens. We also, as we're tracking, we keep track of what's happening to enrollment. And in this case, they went from uh, yeah. down to 347 from 349. They lost two kids at sixth grade, one kid at seventh grade. They added four at eighth grade. And it, if this change, I'm going to change one of these to a bigger number to show a change. If this actually jumped to 400 and we gained 51 kids, that takes another 2.2 FTE at that time to cover it, okay? 
So we are tracking this all the time and as late as possible trying to adjust. Um, we're trying to see if they can create a, a workable master schedule with that 98.5 allocation, but knowing that if there are conflicts or things that aren't working, we have a little bit in the bank. This model includes kind of the district allocation of staff and not, as those of you that are on the finance committee maybe have talked about, any compensatory ads that somebody might make, which would not be part of what Jeff rules for anyway. Okay? Questions for Keith? Well, just to clarify, the compensatory hires are made primarily by the building principles, right? Correct. But are those renewable contracts that, you know, is the multi, you can hire somebody for that, you know, does that go away if the compensatory funding, or are they part of the, of the bargaining unit? It depends on what they, dis I mean, they, they can decide that, but then they're locked in, then they block that in moving forward right. if they put it actually to an FD that they're going to repeat. Okay. So Some of them anticipate that they're not going to have it, so they will do like a one-year kind of a okay. one-year one -year assignment. So we're doing this on a regular basis and just kind of reset it here and even work with the principals on this today. So. Okay. Um, just to kind of piggyback off of Matt's question, so you bring somebody in thinking, okay, this is just going to be a one-year assignment, but then the following year, we still need you, so you do a, another one-year contract. At what point would they be considered permanent? If it was an actual year. teacher and they did the entire year, mm -hmm. um, and then the entire year, the next year, they will have served two years of the probationary, three years, so they'd have another year that they'd be on probation, but then if they we kept them on another year, then they would be a regular staff member. Okay. If it was the whole year. Yeah, usually if, if, if after that first year they think they're gonna to continue to fund that, then it probably would convert to a regular, you know, regular position. Okay. But um, most, most of our elementary principals, for example, don't have that kind of comp ed really. The high school has the most comp uh, because of the number of students. And, uh, but they just have a little bit to supplement. Just to clarify what Keith is saying on that, in your scenario, Paul, um, if somebody was being funded through compensatory three years in a row mm -hmm. and then they became a regular, that I think what Keith is saying, they would move into one of these positions that's funded through right. your regular allocation. Mm -hmm they would be out of that kind of, it, it, there is some consistent flow with compensatory, but to some degree you have to look at it as one-time money, you don't want an ongoing it's expense to be coming out of there. Right. Yeah. Because if you hire a teacher, it could be a 30-year commitment, and if you've got year-to-year -year funding, it, uh, right. <laughs> but the, there, there's times where you, you can get it. Yeah. Okay, so this was really about the process that we're using in that overview. Yeah. I can yeah, see this is a really useful tool for yeah. principals. So to Jeff's point about creating that staffing contingency, just rolling everybody forward regardless of retirement or residence <coughs> or not, um, what do we do to incent teachers to notify us early of their retirement? Or is that, have we? Yeah, we don't have an incentive per se. We have something in a contract, <laughs> you know, the, a date that um, people should let us know. But sometimes you still don't get uh, yeah, we don't have an incentive necessarily for people, people to tell us that. Although I think um, I think our principals uh, and people have been pretty respectful of it. You know, in terms of principals, go to the folks and say, hey, if anybody's thinking, or you know, let us know. But, yeah. Um, I don't I don't think we've gotten a lot of really late ones. Okay. Uh, I think people have been pretty respectful of it. Because that when they retire, that allows us to hire. I mean, I understand teachers who've earned the right to retire on their own terms not wanting to right. be recognized or, okay, all spring they're dealing with other right. staff members, but it really helps from yeah. the staffing process to know early where we're yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And then we have a May 1st deadline for, or not May 1st, March 1st deadline for that kind of thing. And, and people let us know. People are pretty good about it. Yeah. Thank how you. Long, how long have we had this model? This is our second year. I'm, I'm, 
it's simple yet sophisticated. Uh, the, the, the links within it and the very and the uh, flexibility it provides is phenomenal, and yet I followed it. It's certainly not something I do, but I followed your presentation. I can see how useful a tool it is. So I'm pleased to see, I mean, I can see it's benefiting from this in years gone by, but it's a wonderful tool. Well, we used it last year, then took a feedback from principals, and it made key things. Tasha and I made changes, and so we're making it better. Great. Right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Both. Very insightful. All right, we'll move on to a communications department report. Ashley, you going to come on up? Yes. And if you're going to drive over there, you're going to come up here. Oh, no. I'll, <laughs> I'll come up. Okay. Mike meets with a member of cabinet and a few weeks ago we were talking and thought it would be a good idea for me to come present information to you all about communications department, how we serve the district, go over some of our goals and uh, get some feedback from you all on what we can do to increase engagement and improve communications. All right, so I'll just jump right into it. Um, our communications department, the mission is to provide accurate and timely information to students, parents, staff and community members about our school district. So what does a communications department do for a district? Uh, we communicate internally and externally. Uh, we handle the school district's publications, that includes newsletters, as well as internal news releases and any um, important announcements. We also write news releases and send those to the media in hopes that we can get some positive news coverage. Uh, Amanda gets several of those from me. And we also serve as the media liaison for the district. So if the media has a question, they would reach out to us first and then we can work with the superintendent, the school board, or teachers to help them get the story and get the information they need. And we also handle imaging and marketing. That means promoting uh, strengths and achievements of our teachers, students, basically telling our story. We also do a lot of um, publicizing our student and students and staff, um, talking about the good things happening in our school district. You guys probably see those, um, those. emailers every Friday, every Friday. 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 Yes, yeah. they're catching on. People are emailing us now saying, hey, include this in Good News Friday. We'd appreciate it. So that's what we wanted. Um, also serve as an information station for the district. If someone pops up at the district office and Connie and Brenda need help uh, getting information or answering questions, they call us and go to the front. Uh, people also call us a lot uh, just asking those questions sometimes and needing information, whether it's brochures or pamphlets, anything to help communicate information about what our district does. Um, also public relations trainer, though uh, our new superintendent, he's a natural, he doesn't need any help in this area. Um, but sometimes when our teachers do interviews with the media, we would go over like questions we think the media would ask. That's why it's good that I'm a former television reporter, Crystal McNally, who's our communication specialist. She's a former TV reporter anchor as well, so we can kind of come up with some test questions and throw those at people to say, hey, this is what they may ask. That way you can handle it yourself during an interview. Guiding values, accuracy, timeliness, relevance, and this is a biggie, transparency. Our audience, of course, students and parents, teachers and staff, community partners, as well as the public, of course, taxpayers. We have several ways of communicating information. We use uh, traditional media that includes newspapers, uh, television. We use the uh, City of Shakopee Public Access and Savage TV a lot. Uh, they actually air our school board meetings, Savage and the City, so that's a great resource. We use the red folders for elementary schools. Uh, we send out emails. Also, during uh, bad weather, we had a lot of this last week, uh, those robocalls, and you said you got several of those from me, uh, text messages. <coughs> Our district website, we send out email blasts and social media. So any of you on social media, if you see our stories posting on Facebook, Twitter, like, retweet, don't forget our hashtag, Shakopee Schools. Taking a look at some of the things we do on a daily basis, um, piggybacking off of our social media, we check Facebook and Twitter every day to make sure that we're retweeting and liking any mentions that people have posted about our school district, so that just helps push out the word even more. 
Um, then we also check social media groups to kind of get a grasp if there are any issues or rumors, anything we need to address, and that sort of thing. Ashley, just to show my ignorance on social media. Oh, goodness. And I know that. When you say you have, do you have to look for this stuff, or can can you put a term in so that it flags it for you? You can you can do a few things. You can go to our, let's say Twitter, for instance, yeah. Shop B Schools, and it will pop up our homepage. And on our homepage, it will show you all of our tweets. Your tweets, you know what I'm saying, but what I'm asking, maybe it wasn't clear. If Joe tweeted something about Shop B Schools, mm -hmm. do you know that because you have a flag that says, oh, somebody tweet? Yeah, he, right. can, uh, he can add us, and that means that he tags us yeah, yeah. in whatever he's posting. So and you are notified of that. Yes, we get a notification, <laughs> yes. And then that's another good point to our hashtag, hashtag Shockaby Schools. Hashtags are a way to push your content and to search your content. So if I go to Twitter and put the pound sign, Shockaby Schools, everything that people have tweeted about Very our school good. district using that hashtag, cool. it'll pop up. He'll get there. No. <laughs> we got to get you on Twitter. I no. need to add that to my goals list. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's going to be a fail yeah. goal. Right? I can't make love that. I'm going to I'll be your first follower. Oh my goodness. That's there you go. Yeah. Here's what I made for dinner. I won't go over all of these point by point, but just get a few of these. Um, some of our other tasks that we uh, do throughout the week, every uh, every week, building secretaries, they'll send out a list of events happening at the school for that week and upcoming week. So that's the way that we get a lot of our uh, news stories to say, oh, we need to pop into Sun Path, or we need to pop into Jackson or the high school this week. This is exciting. We need to cover this. Um, when you drive past East and West Middle Schools and you see those marquee signs, we're um, adding that information too, and that has really caught on with the community too because we get emails from outside sources saying, hey, can you communicate this? This would be good information for the community and for teachers and students to know about. So that's a good resource. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, tasks also include, of course, dealing with the media, pushing good news stories. Uh, we've had a lot of those uh, the last week. We had a story about our CAP students in the Shockley Valley News. Uh, Michael Peer on Twin Cities PBS. We also had the Star Tribune covering cold. So it's been it's been a busy but good week. No. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes. Right. And our Alice training that we're hosting at the high school. Yes, <laughs> great job. <Alice. laughs> and by the um, way, my my wife said she was very impressed. She watched you actually. Well, I appreciate that. I've always said I've got a face for radio. So. <laughs> <laughs> And he was on the radio too about what a month ago now with WCCO radio talking about cold. Yeah. All right. Um, and also, when there's of course an incident happens, uh, we're the first contact, or we should be the first contact of uh, the first contact for the media, so that we can figure out how we want to release information, what information we need to release, that sort of thing. And also, my two favorite words: data requests. Other uh, tasks that we are respons responsible for covering school board meetings. After school board meetings, we put out what's referred to as the board brief. Um, we edit the videos, post those online on our YouTube page, and get those over to the city of Shakopee and Savage so they can air those in their public access channels. Also attending the Arts and Communication Industry Council. Um, that's been fun, a nice break from the regular day-to-day -day duties, um, just getting out and meeting with our industry experts. Um, I think we have to thank a new member, don't we? Or Ashley. Amanda, aren't you on, on the? Yeah, we yeah, talked I about attended that. One home meeting. Well, I'm still, official just now. I think it's great. Still, we talked awesome. about it. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. it. I like being opinionated in a safe place. To <laughs> 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 and not our local press be involved in that council. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Um, and also special events. Um, the last was the academy's destination. Planning that. Um, we also had a large part in planning the tenants areas, uh, the forums, the community meeting, meetings that were held around that. So the next event that we are working on is the end of the year staff celebration working with the Human Resources Department. And that will be in May, May 16th, May 16th. Actually, before we move on, I want to give you another compliment. Um, again, having seen the iteration and evolution, is a better word, over the years, I really like and appreciate the school board meeting updates, the board briefs, mm -hmm. and how rapid. I mean, mm -hmm. the next day, I mean, you're you're probably drafting it when you're that's sitting what down I'm there. I'm doing. That's what I'm typing. But I mean, that's a great way to communicate what happens to anybody who wants to read it. And I just compliment you on doing that so well and so thoroughly and so quickly. Oh well, thank you for always returning my emails whenever I have a question. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I appreciate it. 
Yeah, but sometimes it even beats me home. <laughs> I mean, when I called the meeting and I did it, where were you? I <laughs> out <laughs> 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 yeah, I just thought of that when I was pregnant. When I got home, I was already. <laughs> and we spent a lot of time on the website. Uh, the website is really important because this is really the first impression of the school district. If current students or current parents have a question, they need information, this is where they're going first. Um, people are thinking about moving to the district, this is where they're going. So this is the first impression of our district. So it needs to be stay updated, it needs to stay clean with clear, concise, accurate information. Um, moving forward, I mentioned this briefly um, at the beginning of the presentation, but we focus a lot as well on the story content, telling our story, getting out into the buildings to highlight what's really happening with our students and our teachers. And here are some examples of that. As I mentioned, we focus on um, making sure that up, the website is up to date with accurate information. This could be an all day, every day task for Crystal and myself. So that's why we um, took the initiative to form what we refer to as webmasters. Each building has a webmaster. Each department at the district office have, has a webmaster. So we brought those groups of people together separate times. Um, and we train them on how to remove information from the website, how to add information to the website, how to upload documents, how to upload pictures. That way it's a group effort um, to make sure that that information stays updated. Um, so it's really a continuous effort with our IT department and web webmasters. Um, it can be something as simple as making sure that the documents are in PDF versus Word. Um, that sounds small, but it really makes a big difference because everyone can't open a Word document on his or her phone. PDF, that translates across all forms. Um, and we hold trainings and we do follow-ups after trainings. Hey, do you guys have any questions? Do you have any recommendations for topics for the next training? That way it's a continuous process of growth and development. And here are some examples of some recent projects. I mentioned Good News Friday earlier. Winter newsletter, we're actually in the process now of getting quotes um, to print and mail a newsletter. We haven't done that in a while, so that's our focus right now. Finding great stories in our district to publish. The kindergarten guide. And if you've been to West lately, you've probably seen this sign at the welcome desk. So some goals for our communications department is to uh, look into a survey so that we can understand from a community perspective what's working, what's not working, the preferred method of communication, and what our new opportunities are, any new channels that we haven't thought of or haven't explored, and also to increase engagement with the community, looking for those opportunities for Mike to get out and engage with the community, for you all, the board, to get out and engage with the community. So whether that's forums, community presentations, Q&A sessions, really open to anything that you guys think would be great. So feedback. Any feedback on what you think is working, what's not working, and if you have any questions. I have a question. Okay. Going back to, I mean, you have a lot going on here, so I don't want to add to your work. Oh, no, you're but fine. Going back to the webmaster where you're working with the different schools on putting content out there. Yes. Do you guys ever do any um, trainings at, like, their professional development days, talking about how important communication is to get to parents on a more regular basis? We don't do any sort of professional development days, but every year for the new, new teacher orientation, we get in front of the new teachers and talk about communication oh, at that time. some of the older teachers? More experience. No. <laughs> That's a good idea, though. Longer so, tenure. Just a long time. Yes. I mean, the, the, I bring this up, it's so trivial, but um, examples are things like um, dress in your pajama day. Mm -hmm. That may have been communicated to a parent a month ago in a newsletter. Okay, well, we're very busy people. And if that kid misses that because the poor parent never paid attention to that, and then that kid is left out. Mm -hmm. You know, that's very trivial in my opinion, but for that kid, that could be a really big deal. Or even different events going on for the school, you know, like um, Valentine's Day, or just mm -hmm. different things. Sometimes we get those communications in a monthly communication, but seriously, a lot of stuff goes on in a month. And I know a lot of teachers don't update the websites, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of times things don't get updated on the main page of the, 
of the schools. I'm just wondering if there's any. Well, that's something we can definitely work with the principals um, to work on together. Uh, but I know the buildings, they send out separate newsletters uh, to parents. Some do it, I think some do it on a weekly, is Jeff still here? No, on a weekly basis or some do it on a monthly basis. Um, but we can definitely work with them to find out, hey, what are the big events going on so that we can publicize them a little more so that people can put them on their radar. I just that's so from my perspective, I get an email. I don't get a whole lot of stuff in the red folder. Okay. Um, so it's just more communication, I guess, at building level. Okay. And I know that I don't know how much responsibility that is on you guys, but I that's think something we can definitely work with them on to make sure that parents. A lot of schools don't even not. A lot of schools don't even use Facebook or Twitter or whatever. So I mean, I follow you. You have a ton of stuff on yeah. that. So there's a lot of good district information. I just don't know if there's a lot of building. Information. That's something we can look into. Thank you. That's an idea. Thank you. No pressure. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> so um, put it on the list. I've got a couple of questions. I mean, I have a lot of questions, but um, one of them that I wanted to bring forward is um, how we communicate. So, is there a, like a database cleansing that can be done, or, for example, sometimes I get two of the same email. Sometimes I don't get them at all. Like when the school was dismissed on, what day was it, last week? Wednesday, to Thursday at middle school early. My husband got the email, Okay, but I didn't. Are both of you listed as contacts in yes. Infinite Campus? Yep. Then that's something that you would need to notify the school about, and then they can check the settings to yeah. see how you're listed, like who's supposed to be getting the information. Right, because I got it on my school email at, um, account, which, I only have access to on my iPad. Yeah. Okay. But I always got the notifications before I had a school address. So I, I don't know. I'm but sure. I know I usually get at home, our home phone rings, my cell phone will ring twice. Is this for weather? For any, yeah, for any okay. type of, a, you know, sometimes the principal at least will call and remind your parent conferences or whatever mm -hmm. uh, that we get multiple. Yeah, that'll, that's all routed back to Infinite Campus and the way your settings are set up. Every parent's settings are different depending on their preferences. Some parents opt to receive emails, phone calls, and text messages. Some parents just opt to receive a phone call. But should I get two? Two On the same number? We do, because my husband, I put it in my phone number for his name. No, I'm saying like, so, my cell phone I will ring twice. My home phone will ring once. You my husband's cell phone rings. You're getting one as a parent and one as a board member. One as a parent, one as a staff member. Yes. Yes. I think it's all back to your settings. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So probably you can look and see what that is. Yeah, I, so, so I haven't yeah. changed yeah. it to yeah. this. Because what we see now is, Christy, with weather especially, we have different groups that we send messages to. Like the first message we send to staff. So you'll get a notification for that, however you're set up as a staff member. And if you're set up as a parent, when we start sending notifications out to parents, you'll get that round too. Does that make sense? It does, but I still wonder why all of a sudden I don't get emails sent to my home address like I used to, and they only go to my school. And I haven't done a thing. That happened to me too. I had to, I called my school and I said, you need to set me up in my home, not on my work. Well, not no, on my school board. But, okay. Because I haven't done anything to change. I didn't do anything either. It's it just happened. That's weird. Because, like, the Good Fridays, I get at home. And I get on my school. Because I never use my school email address because I, I don't remember it's too long. Yeah. Um, so, I, it just happened one day. Christy, I'll work with our IT department and I'll include you on the email thread so okay. we can figure out what's going on. But they'll have to actually go into your account and look. Okay. Angela, did you say yours changed as well? Or did it change? It, it did. It's hard for me to tell if it changed 100% or not because we were, I was getting emails on my personal phone call or my first personal email. It was rolling. And then I switched and then I got nothing on my home. And everything was coming through the school, so it happens both happened both for Shockey Public Schools and Southwest Metro. Everything's going through the school board email, and I 
don't know why. I don't know if it's the teacher looked at my email and put that in there. I, I don't know why. Could just, we could use these guys as samples for us to just see. Yeah. But I'm all fixed on my side because I contacted them. But I'll start an email thread and we can figure out what's happening. Okay. And the other question I had is, is there a communications plan, whether it's a, on a annual basis, school year basis, that um, is in alignment with what our goals are or what our strategic plan is as a board we have a plan a plan looking out when it comes to the academies um, I've been I've been here going on three years and the reason that we don't have that is because my first two years here were <coughs> mode and just focusing on that um, and then it was one person in the communications department and then I was gone so it's been kind of survival and trying to get back on track um, but in talking with Mike, that's something that we can work on doing to make sure that our goals and what we're doing aligns with where the district is trying to go. And then one thing that wasn't talked about was the Citizens mm -hmm. Advisory <coughs> Communications. Mm -hmm. Citizens when Advisory yeah, Communications called, Committee. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what they do or what the focus is. Mm -hmm. Well, we have about um, 15 members right now. Uh, we meet uh, once every month. The goal is to meet six times per school year. And the goal really is to get input, um, to get their feedback on what we're communicating, what we should be communicating, what issues need to be addressed, and how we should address those issues. Um, if we have something that's happening at any given moment, um, whether it's with the budget, attendance areas, we take, it, take the topic to them and get their feedback. So it's really a sounding, a sounding board because we have members who are not only staff, but parents. Right. And then some people who aren't staff members or parents, they're community members. Right. So we can get the feel from all angles based on that committee. So how has the committee worked? I mean, they, I think it's been, what, a year mm -hmm. since it's been going? How is? It's been working very well. Um, I would say we have a great group of people um, who are committed and dedicated to coming to the table with ideas. Some of the things that we've implemented have been because of that committee. Um, when we, before we implemented the academies, we um, asked their opinion and got great feedback on them, from them on the videos that we should pursue, like what are some of the questions that parents are asking. Um, some of the questions were, my child is afraid he or she will be stuck in an academy. Um, so that was one of, the, one of the videos we produced, but it's been, it's been going well. <coughs> I have two quick ones. Um, I think we've done this in the past. You didn't list it because you, you list a lot of things, but I'm thinking you do this. With all the development that's going on in Shakopee, don't you guys have like a realtor packet mm -hmm. or something that you, and thinking now with, again, they're reaching the point where they're really starting to build homes. Just what are we doing? How do we partner with their realtors so they have materials to share to the prospective buyers? We actually um, worked with John Canny. Uh, we reached out to him before we started putting it together and asked him, hey, what are some things that we need to make sure that we put into this guide? What's the best way to start reaching out to real estate agents in the area? So we uh, worked with him on that and he gave us his input. Um, it's complete. It's on our website now. Realtors have been reaching out to us, asking us for that information. Um, a church reached out to me last week uh, wanting the information too. So now that we're in a better position uh, than we were last year, even two years ago, we are going to look at printing that versus putting it on our, web, on our website for others to print, looking at making some copies so that it will be easily available. I would hope that with all the development taking place that we're seeing more utilization of that. And that's a rhetorical comment that I don't know that it is, but I would hope it would be so. That's one. The other one is when you were talking about all the things, just the sheer volume of things you have to do, the web updates, and, and is there any way, and this is just purely a thought, with the Arts and Communications Academy, which is kind of where this would lie, we're looking for kids, the kids are looking for internship opportunities. Mm -hmm. Could we not have internal interns who have an interest in that area? And, and this, again, is not to put you on the spot, but maybe other places in the district that, you know, be it finance or HR or whatever it might be. It would just seem like this area in particular, though, with all the social media, et cetera, and it, it can be kind of task-oriented, seems like it could be a really good place for internship opportunities for our kids. Have we even thought about that? Maybe it's too soon. I don't know. 
I hadn't thought about that per se because we um, are used to partnering with CAPS students. Right. Um, but this would be along those same lines. But not every kid's going to be in CAPS. <coughs> and, right. and the CAPS program tends to not just handle those kids uh, in terms of that particular employer or whatever, but I'm just wondering if there might be an opportunity internally. You've got plenty of work. Mm -hmm. I don't know, again, I'm thinking out loud and I'm not trying to commit anybody to anything. It's just maybe something worth exploring. <laughs> Definitely something uh, to explore. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Great work, great yeah, summary, lots of good great. stuff. Some stuff. Thank you very much, Ashley. Thank, thank you, Crystal, too. Great Anyone work. else that, that touches this, but thank you very much to you guys. And let me know if you all ever have any uh, recommendations or have any questions about anything. Okay. Thanks for keeping us connected. Oh, you're welcome. Gotta join Twitter, Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Not hold your breath. All right, moving on to I think our last big bucket item. Uh, Mike, you want to talk talk to Trust Edge? Sure. I know we've we've uh, we've referenced Trust Edge uh, a couple times at, in different things we've been doing. I know the the uh, folks who attended uh, the MSBA conference got to see David Horsager. Uh, present a keynote. I know some of you bought the book. I know at least a couple board members are attending a conference uh, March 17th and 18th. I'm planning to attend that as well. There's uh, room for uh, one or two more people, so if you have an interest, let us know. Uh, Sunday evening, March 17th, and then basically the work day, Monday, March 18th, in St. Peter. Yeah. But I just wanted to, you know, I, I know I've touched on it a little bit when I, you know, on the, the uh, Redmond's wrap at the end of the week, and uh, just wanted to share a little bit deeper as I've started to reread, or I'm reading his new version of his book, The Trust Edge, How Top Leaders Gain Faster Results, Deeper Relationships, and a Stronger Bottom Line. I would say that David Horsager's main audience is primarily a business audience. It's definitely a leadership audience. And you know, I started kind of digging through again, and just you know, sometimes I think we talk about it, and we go, "Oh, that's just sort of a soft skill, or that's kind of flowery, it's how to how to be nice, or how to how to do those things." He would argue vehemently that it's not just a soft skill. He's done an incredible amount of research, and his team and other folks on on what is trust, and then you know, he would say trust is tangible, learnable, and, and measurable, uh, and the costs are very very high when the trust is low. And a lack of trust can often be a company's biggest expense. And I wanted to, to just roll through one example and uh, you know, kind of his eight pillars uh, at, at the foundation of this. But I wanted to, and this is a rhetorical question, but how much does lack of trust cost our organization in terms of relationships, loyalty, retention, and influence? Uh, and then I would even say, how much does it cost in terms of inefficient use of resources and I'm going to give one example, not because it's this earth-shattering example, maybe because it isn't, but I think it's one that we repeat dozens, if not, you know, far more times than that. Uh, and it, you know, we recently had an incident. Um, you know, our communication team, you know, did what they did. You just perfect timing, following up the communications presentation. You see how hard they work. You see how professional they they provide stuff. Well, we received critical feedback in terms of our communication of this particular event. And it came in the form of, why was the school district so slow to communicate? It was really uh, the prescient detail. They kept hitting on, why are you so slow to communicate? Why didn't the school district communicate better? Uh, and then they threw in, it was an event that we were working on with the police, and you know, we cut, you know, the police were getting positive feedback. Police, and then we were getting sort of being used as a measuring tool there that, well, the police department communication was better and faster than the communication of the school district. So what did we do? We do what we typically do. We went back and we picked apart the communication, <laughs> detail by detail, process it. I lay awake at night going, what the heck? What? It, it seemed like we did everything just right. Why, why are we getting that criticism? And of course, we go right back to it and we pick it apart again and go, how can we communicate better? How can we communicate better? Well, that wasn't the issue. And that was really the, what I would say was the aha moment that uh, the communication was fine. I would say the communication was well done even. And so uh, the criticism, however, stemmed from a lack of trust. 
And, and I think it's interesting to note, we even did that communication in partnership with the police, shared the message, and sent it out at exactly the same time. And remember, we got criticized for being slow. We were, they were held up as an example of, wow, the police communicated way better than you did. <coughs> and I even lost sight of that and went, wait a second, we communicated with them in real time. And that was the aha moment is, you know, it, it, it wasn't the communication, it's that trust and it's that cost of trust. And so I think it's really important that we continue to work hard to rebuild trust. I see that happening. I see great things happening in the district. We want to be open. We want to be transparent. Uh, I'm going to quickly roll through David Horsager's The Trust Edge, The Eight Pillars of Trust. Uh, number one is clarity. You know, be clear about objectives, priorities. Uh, you know, make sure that the people we're working with know those things. A and then how many can communicate, you know, our objectives, our top priorities, you know, quickly and clearly. Uh, he, he really focuses on three questions to get to clarity. And, and I need these questions asked of me, to be quite honest. I'll say something, and I would love it if the response is, well, how? And then the next one is, well, no, exactly how. Well, how are you going to do that? And, and I think we need to refine clarity and be really focused on, on being clear. The second pillar is compassion. We trust people who think beyond themselves. One of the reasons I love working in the world of education. There are a lot of people who think beyond themselves. They show up every day trying to help students, trying to build a better world. Uh, David Horsager mentions the number one example of that is mom. You know, most people's moms. They, they, they go over and above and they always think beyond themselves. And, uh, you know, he gives an example of Delta Airlines changed the way they treated their own people. And guess what? The customers started, started being treated better as a result. He talks about character as a pillar. You know, sincerity would be related to that. Do what's right, not what's easy. Uh, it's, is it, and then he asks a question, and it's a great question. Is it better to be trustworthy or trusted? And there's no comparison. It's much better to be trustworthy. Um, and then competency, it's kind of like the con conservation of energy. You know, input shapes output. Input always equals output. What are people bringing to the process? Be aware of that and, uh, and work to improve that. He talks about commitment as a pillar. Commitment breeds commitment. People love working with people who are committed, committed to something bigger than themselves. Uh, he talks a lot about personal accountability. Uh, and then he even gives, and there's great research to support this, specific accountability, having a specific accountability appointment increases the chances of reaching a goal from 10 to 95 percent. And when I read that, I immediately reflect to some of those things when I was working directly with principals. Hey, I want to get better at this. Great, I'm going to check in with you once a month just to see how you're doing on that goal. And guess what? Just that monthly check-in improves that performance. You should call it inspect what you expect. Yeah, exactly. Inspect what you expect and do it consistently. And, it's, and everybody has the same goal. But human nature sometimes gets in the way. So it's, it's, a, it's a supportive thing. It's not meant to be you know, punitive in any way. It's, hey, I'm just going to check in. Tell me how you're doing. And typically, when you know somebody's coming to check in, you're doing it. And, and it's kind of fun then to learn that. Uh, I use a coaching example. I used to coach a lot. I would always start a season and go, so how do you want to be this year? Hey, we want to be good. We want to have a great season. Ah, so what? So does everybody else. That is not, I've never met a team in my life that didn't want to have a really good season. So you just wanting to have a baseball. <laughs> What's that? You don't watch Twins baseball. <laughs> they start every year right now. They're okay. getting excited about their time. Awesome. They're tied for first place. <laughs> but I use the race right now. And when you're dealing with high, high school high. students, they were always, what? So what? Who cares? You want to be good. So does everybody else. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? to be different than the others. What are you going to do to separate yourselves? And he talks, and that's that accountable culture. Create a target or a goal. Have a clear commitment. Have a metric. How are you going to measure that? You know, have a clear check-in, clear rewards and consequences. Uh, and I think that's, that's some of those ways that we can separate, you know, from just that desire to be good to actually becoming good. And then connection is a very, very important pillar. Uh, one of the things in our society, and this is maybe the old social studies teacher in me, 
We have the myth in our society of the solitary genius or the lone hero. Very, very, very few, if any, of those things really happen. They were typically done by teams and collaboration. Scientists, we, we build this one up a lot, the lone scientists, you know, even in our movies. Scientists are constantly building on the work of previous scientists and others and collaborating and improving it. And so uh, collaboration is huge. Uh, David Horsager gives the, the number one trait of the most magnetic people on earth is gratitude. gratitude. Be grateful. You know, and I think that's a really valuable lesson. Contribution, you must deliver results to be trusted. At the end of the day, that, that's what matters, reward results. Be honest and open about making mistakes. We're all going to do that. Uh, recognize specific contributions. You know, general praise is nice. Specific praise is much, much more meaningful. Uh, delay decision making increases confusion, clutter, and stress. Uh, and then he talks a lot about consistency. It's the little things done consistently that make the biggest difference. I had my own little editorial on the bottom. I try to be real clear. I've got a 26-year-old son and a 23-year-old son. I, my, my message to them is show up, do what you say you're going to do, follow through. So show up and follow through. If you do those things, you're going to be successful. So that was my little you know, kind of spiel. I wanted to go a little more in-depth with some of that. Uh, I, I think it's just great learning. I've been familiar with David Horsager for a number of years. I find the research fascinating. Uh, it's about human development, it's about improving folks, and so just wanted to share that with you. And you guys uh, heard him speak at mm -hmm. MSBA. We did. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. We did a two-day keynote. Yeah. He was trying to just half of it at the opening and half of it at the closing. I don't know if I've ever seen a no. keynote over no. two days before that. And, uh, and the book is very good. And Reggie, I follow him on Twitter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's more yeah. incentive. So, so if you know if you send that link to Reggie's daughter, she'll follow him on Twitter and then relay the. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how true that is. Yeah. All right. Good stuff, Reggie. Yeah. But again, and I think it was that first story that was yeah. we've, we've shared, you know, those of us in cabinet and others that you just go, how much time are we spending? really looking at the wrong things and beating ourselves up over it. And it's important. We want to be efficient users of resources. Yep, if somebody, if, if we receive critical feedback, we're going to take that to heart. We're going to examine it and look at it. But we also have to be aware that sometimes that critical feedback isn't criticizing what we think it is and give ourselves permission to move on, uh, move forward, and, and do great things for kids. And so that was really why I shared that example. All right, we're nearing the finish line here, folks. Uh, very productive, but a little bit longer meeting. Uh, I don't think we have any further discussion or action items, so we'll skip past that. Seven, eight. Other, we'll go around the horn. I think we've had a couple of committee meetings, so this might be a good time to just uh, touch on those. I'm going to start. I'll go left again. Angela, anything to add? Okay, Christy. We had a policy committee meeting tonight, um, and we are kind of picking up where the last group left off with uh, looking at um, a few things. Uh, policy 533, um, we're going to bring that back to the committee um, hopefully soon. Um, the one on this one? Yes. And then the policy 534, Still which bad. is the uh, um, meals, paid meals. Uh, Kate meals. <laughs> Um, from what I understand, that will be brought back to the to the board for a first reading at our next meeting for review. Like in two weeks. Yes. Oh, great. And then um, Mike and Sarah are going to take a stab at the uh, 600 series, which we talked about in somewhat depth tonight. So that's uh, an update from, from that committee. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Nothing, actually, just one quick question. I see we've got the 18-19 school calendar attached here, and I love it as a practice. I've started getting questions from friends and neighbors about the 1920 the school calendar. Do we know if that's going to be coming up any time or not? I think it's on the website. Is it on the website? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's my own other. Approved it. It's that's what I thought, but yeah, I couldn't, right, couldn't recall. Yeah. 
but that's a good clarification. It is online. Perfect. It is. Thank you. So, that's great. All right. Yeah. Ash, anything else? No, nothing to add. Sarah? And then for 2021, we've started to speak about um, that calendar with the SAA. Okay. Uh, Nancy? Nothing. Okay. Councilwoman Contreras? Stick safe on the roads. <laughs> that's our tip to move it along, move it along. Yeah, that's, right. that's right. Keith? Nothing. Okay. Dave? Uh, February 20th at uh, juniors only at the high school. Uh, they're taking the ACT full with writing that day. That we've done that a number of years in a row. Uh, I did check with one of our principals. Kindergarten open houses are they're taking registrations right now, but they're not uh, having open houses on April 18th and 23rd. I'll add a little bit to the Redmond's wrap on this, but uh, John JT and I had a meeting with all 11 sports associations last week. Uh, I meant to get it in there this week, and the wrap just flew out too fast for me. So uh, I'll elaborate on that a little bit this week. It was a good meeting, though. Good. 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 Paul, good to see you here. <coughs> Mobile? Relatively. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, Right now, no, I don't have anything. I was kind of in communion kind of all, all week last week, so. Understood. Good to have you back. Joe? I don't have anything. Okay. Judy? Facilities um, Committee met. It was mostly informational, telling us what Bach had done and helping us to understand it. And I think they did a really good job that I felt much more enlightened going out than coming here. <laughs> um, and uh, there'll still be some Bach type things that will be on our list. But next week, we're going to start with looking at some priority stuff. I think a lot of what we're going to do eventually is going to depend upon some things we do in our retreat before. That'll kind of feed the agenda after the retreat. Okay. And anything else that I missed? I would make sure that as we seek to build the agenda, make sure we know what those things are that you guys are thinking you need direction on that might come out of retreat so we can make sure build them in the agenda. So. Make sure we know that. Okay. Uh, I have, I thought I had something in there. I guess I did. I gotta look at the weather one more time. At least. <laughs> 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 you get back if you're long driving. Who's building the agenda for that retreat? So if we have topics we might like to discuss, who do you Mike and I, and that's it. And I'm sure with the mix of everything else, last meeting I said, be thinking about those things and send them to me. So okay. if you got ideas, send them to me. One thing I will just tell you that we have historically, and gee, this is a business thing too, I'm sure you've all experienced this. Sometimes gyms get over set and you never get to, sure. I hate that. So I would much rather prioritize and just kind of tell you my theory and maybe get into a few things deeper. Um, you can do anything, you can't do everything is another phrase I like. So if you have ideas, please send them to me. Well, the, great, the great news with the market date is yeah. that we have another retreat in June, July, right? So it's not like we're six, nine months yeah. between. So if some things get bumped, it's better to have yeah. it. And even at a work session, yeah. you know, I'm trying to take, yeah. take ideas from you, and that was kind of the communications. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought, you know, I thought David Keith with how they do staffing, I think it's very important, and especially if you've got some right. folks yeah. brand new to this. So don't, don't hesitate to share those. And it's a great idea there, and great clarification. It doesn't have to wait for a retreat. You've got a topic, you know, and, and there's enough uh, energy behind it, if you will, that it might be something covered in the session. But please do get those in. Okay, um, update on meetings. So we had the committee meetings. Um, there is, this week, they're not listed, but there is you know, on Wednesday two meetings steering the uh, Academy Steering Committee, that's you and me, and then CFAC also meets Wednesday night. Um, I've told Joe that I cannot make that one. I don't know if Angela might instead. That's, that's fine. But CFAC meets, that's the Citizens Financial Advisory Committee meets Wednesday night. Uh, then we have 25th Finance Committee meeting in advance of the board meeting. And then facilities meets on the 27th. So those are kind of the upcoming meetings. Anything else? Did you say 6 o'clock Wednesday? 6 o'clock Wednesday, yes. And for what it's worth, um, the finance committee usually sends a couple of representatives to CPAC, and, yeah. and historically it's been Angela and I. I think going forward, probably Joe and I. I just can't make Wednesday night, so Angela may. I'm not putting her on the spot. She may. So, I know Joe will be there. 
Okay. Great meeting. Very productive. With that, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Paul. Second. Thank you, Christy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. And then we have.